Welcome to week three. We're still working on the cluster add and subtract within 20. Last week we looked at the second part of the standard involving sums of one digit numbers. Now we're going to turn our attention to the first part of the standard which extends that expectation to subtraction as well as addition and it extends our number combination to all those within 20. The ideas discussed here are natural extensions of the work that is done to foster fluency of those single digit numbers that we discussed last week. Let's take a look though at how the two parts of the standard work together and how they're different. Because arithmetic strategy work began in first grade, the bulk of the work that you have to do with single digit sums will likely be focused on automaticity. That is dependent, of course, on the extent to which you see your students applying those first grade strategies. So last week we discussed how those could be developed in the students if you don't see them using that. But if your school has made a concerted effort to fold in the Common Core expectations, you'll likely find that your work with single digit sums is mostly on the reinforcement practice activities of using those strategies and also on dealing with just a few of those pesky facts which aren't still, still fluent. As students gain fluency over the year, they're going to get to the point where they know those single digit sums quickly enough that you aren't, you aren't really actually sure whether they're using memory or whether they're using strategy. For addition facts beyond the single digit sums and for subtraction facts within 20, you're going to see a slightly slower response indicating that it's using more cognitive processing. They have to think of a strategy and there's a real risk here that rather than taking the time to think of a strategy, they'll revert to counting strategies which are inefficient. In fact, this seems paradoxical, but the more time pressure you place on them early on, the more likely they are to abandon strategic things thinking and just try counting. You and I both know that counting is not a very efficient strategy, but they can think of it right away. It's their default mode. So we want to change their default mode to a strategy that they can look at numbers and go, oh, I can use that strategy. If they can quickly choose a high quality, efficient strategy as opposed to counting, then they're going to get faster. The work that you do to address standard 2.08.2 is meant to help students get to that point where they can quickly choose an efficient strategy that works for the numbers if, and uh, by doing so help them to get faster at applying that strategy and therefore find the sum more quickly. Here you see the two parts of the standard compared. Single digit sums have a goal of automatic retrieval, which means they've got to that place where they just know it so quickly you're not sure whether they got it from a pattern, from memory, or um, from a strategy because they get to the point where they can apply those strategies pretty fast. It just seems smooth and almost effortless. Now the fact that they learned those strategies in the first place uh, learned them first with a strategy though does pay off here because the strategies grow. Those strategies can be extended to bigger numbers as you'll see here today. In the right hand column you see examples of the facts that are included in the first part of the standard and those are the ones we're discussing this week. In this case our instructional goal is to support the learner in quickly finding and implementing a strategy that will be effective for that number combination. The student goals for the single digit sums involve fast, accurate, and nearly effortless retrieval of sums, but over here the student goals for these remaining addition and subtraction facts within 20, they also involve accuracy, of course that's important, and we still want them to be fast, but notice that we're allowing them uh, approximately double the time just to allow for that additional um, retrieval of, of and implementation of a strategy. The extra few seconds required is still fluent enough for them to not risk too much cognitive load during problem solving. So it's not going to interfere with their capacity to problem solve, which is really the ultimate goal of building fluency so that they can maintain a high cognitive load during problem solving um, by not having to think so hard for their facts. So we still are able to maintain that goal. Now the speed that I've given here within five to six seconds represents an end goal. Again, if you place that speed pressure on them too soon, then they will end up trying to count, which is, uh, and, and probably doing it with a lot of errors. The mental strategies first learned in first grade 
um, and which we reinforce in fostering that single digit fluency are really the foundation for the mental strategies that we're going to use with larger sums and differences. And using these strategies continually reinforces children's understanding of number relationships and properties of operations. So we have the added benefit of, of building number sense at the same time. Some of them are particularly well suited to subtraction, so a couple of these we'll be hearing more about in the next lesson. For the purpose of this lesson, though, we're going to be focusing on number combinations that sum to 20, because that's the language of the standard. Obviously, second graders work with larger numbers as well, but that is where work is included in other standards, like number and base 10. So therefore, we're going to deal with those in a different PD module. Here you see the addition number combinations that sum to 20 that we didn't cover last week when we were talking about single digit sums. The bottom left portion is in gray because those, sum, those facts sum to greater than 20, although frankly the strategies that we're going to be discussing in this lesson can also be applied to those sums and second graders should be working with those combinations, it's just that we don't put them under the same speed pressure. Often applying the mental strategy to the gray sums uh, involves some regrouping and that's going to create the, uh, a, a situation where they're going to be slightly slower. Um, but the same strategies will apply and can also be used and eventually they can build up that speed as well. You will notice that similar to our discussion of single digit sums that we've chunked these facts according to some useful strategies that can be applied. I don't want you to think that we're trying to funnel children into a mandated strategy for a given number combination. Last week there were some facts that ended up on the list for more than one strategy. For example, 9 plus 8 could be solved using a doubles plus 1 or a make 10 strategy and it can be the child's choice but we want them to understand and be able to use both so that they have a, a repertoire of strategies at their disposal. The top row in yellow is that tens and leftover pattern again which was first introduced in kindergarten and which should be very familiar to students and also the green facts that you see here are the plus one pattern. Again, these should be extremely familiar to second grade students. Before we go into the actual strategies that we um, saw uh, listed on that color coded chart, I want to take just a moment to place what we're discussing in the context of the curriculum. Uh, there were some really foundational ideas that were built in kindergarten and first grade and we're going to be relying on them. We are going to be needing that skill set and that knowledge uh, to, for what we're going to do with mental math so we need to take a look at where the students have been coming from and what you'll notice here are a couple of really critical things. They learn to compose and decompose numbers. In fact, there's uh, several different places in the kindergarten curriculum that get it, the composing and um, decomposing and so that's something that we really want students to be able to do and they've been practicing that since kindergarten if the teachers have been working with Common Core. Um, we really need them to understand the idea of tens and ones and that shows up in a number of places. We also want them to have strategies and have those strategies not be arbitrary tricks but be based on our number system, place value, properties of operations and the relationship between addition and subtraction and that started back in first grade. All of these ideas plus the idea of one, tens being added with tens and ones being added with ones all of those, you will see those playing out in the implementation of the mental math strategies in second grade. Also, the work that we are discussing in this lesson will support your students in other parts of the second grade curriculum as well. So they're going to be really delving in deep to understand strategies. The strategies will be based on our number system, place value, properties of operations, relationships between operations, and all of that strategy work will also help them as they work with numbers up to um, adding and subtracting within 100 using those same strategies but extended to large numbers. First they learn them for small numbers and also knowing those strategies so well they can explain why they work and um, mathematically why they work. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of slides that just build the idea of a prerequisite skill and then we're going to delve into the strategy a little bit more deeply. But uh, they do need to decompose number so that if we're going to take a teen number and add a single digit number with it, we need to be able to take that teen number and decompose it into a 10 and a leftover. That will allow us to add tens with tens and ones with ones. In this case, when we we're talking about teen numbers, there's only one 10, but uh, they'll still have that opportunity of combining ones with ones. 
And then, of course, they also need some skill in recomposing it. So we're decomposing it. We're going to add it in a different order. That's a property of operations. And then we're going to recompose it into a whole. So we started with 15 plus 4. We break it into a 10 and a 5. We have 10 plus 5 plus 4. We add the 5 plus 4 first. We recompose those two. And then we recompose 10 and 9 to get 19. One of the tools that I like to use to foster the use of that strategy uh, when students are in reinforcement, of course, I have to model it well first, but I like to use place value arrow cards. These can be purchased commercially, but mine are homemade here. I've included a link for a template in the teaching resource section if you'd like to make your own. To represent a particular number, the arrows have to be aligned. And that means that the only way that you can make the number 15 is to combine a 10 and a 5. You cannot do it with a 1 and a 5. Because if you take a 1 and a 5 and you align the arrows, only one of those digits will be seen. So they can see that that 1 is not a 1. It is a 10. And so that is one of the things I really like about the place value cards. Um, so I make the number 15 and I decide I want to add 4 to that number. Before I do the computation, I say, let's take a look at what we've got here, and I decompose it. What is 15? Oh, it's a 10 and a 5. And um, so I say, so I'm supposed to combine the 10 and the 5 and the 4. Then I draw their attention to the 5 and the 4. Hey, this looks familiar. Um, I think you know this. What is that? So they can tell me 9, and I can ask for a strategy, because I want to also foster my single-digit fact fluency. So they might say that they um, did 4 plus 4 plus 1 more. Uh, or maybe they say they know 5 and 5 is 10, so 5 and 4 must be 9. And then we convert the whole thing into a 10 plus a 9. The strategy that you witnessed here is called combining 10s and 1s. It's a very powerful strategy for students to perfect because it's very useful for mental math with larger numbers as well. So a student who can easily pull apart a double-digit number and combine the tens, combine the ones, and recompose, they're able to also say, well, 24 plus 45 has a 20 and a 40, that makes 60, and a 4 and a 5, that makes 9, so it's 69. They don't have to pull out paper, they don't have to line numbers vertically, they don't have to find their pencil and sharpen it. They should be able to do that mentally. One big hurdle to get past as children apply their mental math strategies is the need to regroup. And in the second grade fact mastery list here that first sums up within 20, they're going to get to that concept just with the numbers that exactly sum to 20. Children are going to need experience um, where they've modeled this dilemma concretely so they can see how you can take 10 individual units and make it into a group of 10. And in order to build a strong foundation for mental math in the future, second graders really need to build that foundational place value concept that allows them to move flexibly between classifications of individual units and groups while maintaining the actual quantity. For example, they're going to need to be able to think of the number 58 as 58 individual units, or as 50 plus 8, or as 5 tens and 8 ones, or as 4 tens and 18 ones. They need to really understand many, many ways of breaking a number apart and putting it together while maintaining quantity. All of these that I just mentioned are uh, accurate and equivalent interpretations. But sometimes children run into trouble when they try to recompose a number, and they end up with more than nine ones. What is that number? What is the total sum? And how do I write that sum down? And so this is where concrete modeling can be especially helpful. Here we see two representations being used together so that children move back and forth between a concrete and a more abstract representation. And we begin by using those place value cards that we just saw to model 14 plus 6. And then I have shown a base 10 block representation of each of these quantities. Next, I'm going to decompose, just like we did before, the 14 into a 10 and a 4. And I'll say, uh, compare this to the base 10 representation. Do you see a 10? Do you see a 4? Where is that? And then with modeling, children can see if we combine the 4 and the 6 that we have 10 ones. And through dialogue, you can get them to see that the 10 ones is the same exact quantity as 1 10. And so you can use the base 10 blocks to help support that. And so they can get to the point where they see that what they have is really two tens and relate two tens to the quantity of 20.
So there's benefit to multiple representations, and I take advantage of that further by modeling it also on the board, what we just did, going back and forth, look at this, okay, this is how I would write this, by writing it more abstractly, as you see here. Um, we would go back and look at that concrete representation to make sense of what we're doing and how we ended up with 20 and how many groups of 10s there were. And in particular, we would notice that we have these two groups of 10 and there's no leftover little units other than the ones, you know, we have the ones that make up the 10s, no little ones. Then they would have to answer, put their answer in a template. I like to give them a little template that has room for one numeral card and one numeral card only. And the numeral cards are 0 through 9. So they don't have an option of putting 10 ones in the ones box. And this places a constraint on them that they have to resolve. I have, for example, they might say that they have a 10 and they have 10 ones. That is true and accurate, but it doesn't help them with deciding what number they have. So they would have to get to the point where they can recognize that those 10 ones make a 10. And you can't put 10 ones in the ones column. So this is, again, all of the work that you do here is going to be helpful down the road. Take the time to fully develop these concepts. Make sure they make sense. Don't try to rush this at all. Um, as long as it takes, you're laying a critical foundation to one of the biggest ideas of our number system. It is definitely worth the time that you spend to make sure that students really understand quantitatively what's going on when they make a 10. Once students understand the strategies that we've discussed so far, they can work on getting faster and implementing them, although they're never going to be able to exceed the speed b uh, by which they generate that single digit sum that uh, occurs when they decompose a number. So let's give an example of what I mean by that. If we take that 15 plus 4 that we looked at a couple of minutes ago, they can never be faster than it takes them to solve 5 plus 4. So their single digit fluency is what will determine how quick they can be once they get comfortable with using this strategy. And um, so if they know 5 plus 4 quickly, they're going to be able to do this fairly quickly. There's not a lot of extra added um, cognitive processing required once they get used to the strategy because the strategy is based on um, skill sets that supposedly have been developed since kindergarten and continually been reinforced. Another instructional approach that you have at your disposal to build this idea are number talks. We discussed those last week. You can easily construct your own num string for a number talk. You should have a target fact in mind that's difficult. That becomes the end of your string. And I've used 13 plus 6 or 16 plus 3 as my difficult ones. And then what is it, what's the easy fact that I'd like them to convert it into? 10 plus 9, so I'm going to make that my top fact. And then what do you have to do in between? you have to decompose. So I've got a couple of different decompositions and different arrangements there for them to work with. I would present one of these at a time. Somewhere in the middle there we would get into some good discussions about um, essentially the idea behind the associative property. I wouldn't necessarily use that name, but I want them to understand the concept that, that you can add these in any order and it's still the same and to make sense of that. And then that when you recompose those are also the same. So I really want them to grapple with the idea of equivalence, the associative property, decomposing, recomposing. Such a simple little string, but a lot of really um, sophisticated math is embedded in that. Now in this case, my string is focused on equivalence because of my purposes for the string. Not all number talks uh, focus on equivalence. In the next lesson, we're going to be discussing mental math for subtraction, and as you might expect, that's quite a bit more difficult for children. And as it turns out, the work that they've done with addition is going to be hugely influential in what they do with subtraction, because one of the primary strategies we want them to use is to relate the subtraction problem back to addition, because we're thinking of addition as, a, as an area of strength for them. So. Um, Definitely work on building their mental math with addition and getting that a little more solidified before you fold in the subtraction, uh, at least the more difficult subtraction. You can, use, you can build in subtraction with their facts that uh, they have already got fluent, the single digit ones. 
In the past, we've seen some students who were good at mental math and many who weren't, but now Common Core expects us to develop learners who have flexible mental strategies, all learners, um, and those strategies are to be based not on arbitrary rules, but on the very nature of our number system and uh, the properties of operations. The work we do here towards this end will reap other benefits besides just improved mental computation. It's going to support their understanding of place value, their understanding